I want to also thank uh, Horizon Labs for the invitation to speak on, on this conference. And um, yeah, I will start, start right away. We may have some people joining in the next 10 minutes or so, hopefully, but the introduction will be soft anyway, so. Um, yes, um, like just a quick agenda. Um, I will first tell a bit about what the actual goal is with this talk. Um, and then I will go into some, I would say, high-level market overview, um, talk about the um, current marketplace landscape, and that kind of transitions to a motivation about why one, sh one should actually build a new NFT marketplace, all in the context of the Horizon ecosystem. We will then, then see how NFT marketplaces actually work under the hood. I think this is also very important um, to understand why it was maybe hard to build a marketplace two years ago and it has become a little bit easier now. And I will show like the protocol we are working with, which, which is Reservoir Protocol, uh, with a quick demo, and then we will also have some time for questions. Yeah, a little bit about me. I'm Sebastian. I'm um, 32 year, years old from, from Germany. Uh, I started to work in crypto in 2017 and um, like already in 2017 and um, it stayed until now. I really like Ethereum. I like the EVM and Solidity. It's just fun, fun for me to work with the whole Ethereum ecosystem. But at the same time, I'm open to all other technologies. I'm, um, I, I really like that Horizon is also going the EVM direction. That's pretty cool for me. But at the same time, um, you know, I'm, I'm not against any other projects, layer ones like Solana or, or any other stuff. Um, I'm a, a developer. I, the, over the recent time, I mostly spent my time working on Solidity um, stuff, but I'm also a, an investor. I've used, I think, almost any DeFi protocol out there, um, and I've started to trade um, NFTs also very early. Um, the company where I'm, where I'm working for is Create3 Labs. It's a little bit in a transition f f phase. Uh, we are currently rebranding to like yeah, this new brand where before uh, you might have seen my name with, associated with Elbstack or Tixel. So this is a kind of merging together now. And one of our main brands we have is Polychain Monsters. That is an existing NFT project where we learned a lot about the NFT space. It was like we launched it before this board Ape Yacht Club hype before all the 10K drops came out. And we made some mistakes in supply and demand. Like we have 6 million NFTs instead of 10,000. So uh, the mechanics are a bit different, but we are still learning and uh, yeah, trying to, to fix things um, we made. Yeah, so what's the goal of this talk? Mm. So if you are not a developer, then after this talk, you should understand a little bit more about how NFTs actually work, because that's important to understand how NFT marketplaces work. And even if you are not going to launch an NFT marketplace, I think it's valuable for your own maybe trading security, like not getting hacked or um, doing transactions which result in losing your NFTs. Yeah. If you are a developer, or even a Web3 developer, then after this talk, you should be able to like, um, pull out your laptop and um, start implementing uh, an NFT marketplace based on the stack we present. And if you are a Horizon fan, then of course you should um, look forward to what we are um, planning to build on the EVM sidechain. Um, and you will also see that in this talk. So let's, just on a high level, because before we jump to technical stuff, uh, take a look at the existing marketplace landscape. And this is a very sim simplification. Of course, we have much more, but um, this is a high level. On Ethereum mainnet, we currently have, um, I would say, three marketplaces which are getting the most attention from the Web3 community. And these are OpenSea, LuxRare, and X2Y2. OpenSea is still capturing the most volume of all these marketplaces. Step by step, we also see that new marketplaces pop up on the Ethereum L2 scaling solutions. For example, there is MutableX, which is a zero knowledge based uh, marketplace as an Ethereum layer two. So where the marketplace is kind of like an app chain itself. It's not a generic layer two. But we also see marketplaces like Stratos, for example, which is deployed to Arbitrum, which is an optimistic rollup 
for Ethereum. Um, and all of this is like from a strategic perspective, it's important, I think, to understand this when um, we want to build a strategy of how a marketplace can become su su successful on horizon. You have to kind of understand the whole community and whole ecosystem in existence. We do have also Ethereum project-specific marketplaces. CryptoPunks is the most popular one. They've got their own zero-fee marketplace. Um, we've also got, for example, ENS Vision, which is a marketplace just for trading ENS domain names. On Solana, um, and that has uh, grown over the past months, we um, have Magic Eden as the leading marketplace and also Solana Art. And then we have a couple of marketplaces where um, I hope that we see these also deploying to the Horizon EVM sidechain once it's live, um, which are Rarible and Tofu NFT. And these are really they don't focus on dedicated community building on one chain. Instead, they like to spread more and uh, engage with different communities. There's also one new trend uh, coming up mainly on Ethereum at the moment. I assume we will see that later on on other chains as well, and that is that we do see AMMs for NFTs where you kind of put in NFTs and liquidity and people then trade with your liquidity instead of and they pay the liquidity providers for trading instead of paying royalties to creators. So this is a new trend, and we have to see how this turns out, but I just wanted to um, throw that in so that uh, we have a whole picture. The trading volume for NFTs, um, if you look at Ethereum now, is currently on an all-time low if we look at 2022. Um, but... I think this is um, a healthy correction. Um, I mean, I've joined crypto in 2017, and uh, in 2018, we've seen kind of the same with, with DeFi, where every, all the protocols have been drying out, and there was nobody using them at all. And then uh, late in 2018, it was all picking up again. And I'm, I'm super convinced that we will see the same for NFTs. And um, so we should, I think for Horizon, we should, uh, really focus on delivering the EVM and then being there with the NFT marketplace as soon as the next NFT bull run kicks in. Um, yeah. The Solana trading volume, that's pretty interesting, even though the Ethereum NFT market is currently on a cool down period. Um, Solana trading volume has been on a rise recently. Um, so this is mainly trading happening on Magic Eden. And I don't know if any one of you knows um, the D-Gods project or Utes. Like, these have been the projects that caught the most attention on Solana recently. And these are also the, mainly the adoption drivers of the Solana um, ecosystem. So where we have, and that's only my personal opinion, where we have um, Yuga Labs mainly leading the NFT um, ecosystem on Ethereum, we, th we kind of see D-Gods and um, Utes are leading on Solana. So, and that leads to the question, um, also in the Horizon context, why should you launch an NFT marketplace these days? And um, the first point is, of course, to conquer a new chain. Um, when a new EVM chain or a new blockchain in general pops up, um, usually there's uh, just a handful of NFT marketplaces deploying in the beginning, but then mostly only one turns out to be successful, and that's usually, from our perspective, the one where the community building is really dedicated to the chain the marketplace is launching on. We've seen that with Magic Eden on Solana, for example. Um, they might now also like build stuff for Ethereum, but their main community is still on Solana. You can, on the other hand, also compete with existing ones. Um, like LuxRare did a couple of months ago where they um, like could grab a lot of volume from OpenSea. That's also an option, but from my perspective, a much harder part. And if you have an existing NFT community, your own project, you can also build a marketplace for them and let them trade, for example, for zero fees or give them other benefits when they trade on your marketplace. So now um, let's get to the tricky point. Like, how do these market marketplaces actually work? And to understand that, I want to go down to really the NFT basics. And this is, I think, also interesting for um, every one of you who's not a developer. But maybe one question before, who in this room owns an NFT? 
Okay, so 50%, I would say. That's good. Um, what, what is an NFT really? If we look, uh, if we look at Ethereum-based NFTs or Ethereum virtual machine-based NFTs, these NFTs are really just on-chain mapping. So this is a code snippet from an ERC721 contract. ERC721 is like a standard defined by um, the Ethereum community where everyone agreed to implement NFTs according to this standard. And this is code I extracted from an implementation of the ERC721 standard. And the most used one is the one built by Open Zeppelin, which is a company building very good Ethereum smart contracts. So this is used by almost any NFT project out there. Uh, I think I even um, yesterday I looked up that, for example, Board Ape Yacht Club is using their base for almost all their NFT contracts. And what we see in the code here is, what we have first is a mapping from a number to an address, or let's say from an ID to address. So in the contract, uh, for every NFT ID, let's say you have the ape with ID 100, in the contract, there is a mapping where it says, okay, this ID belongs to this address. And that is to find out, okay, who owns which NFT, which address is the owner of an NFT. Then, in addition, we have the address mapped to a number of how many NFTs of a collection an owner has. This is stored separately um, due to, so that you will be able to find out the balance of, um, of a wallet of a certain collection. So you can like, find out, okay, how many apes does a wallet have, for example. And then, in addition, and this is for security reasons, it is stored... Um, which token ID can be used by which address. So I can, for example, say, okay, I will give um, live, for example, token approval for my ape with ID 100, and then even though it's in my wallet, live will be allowed to transfer my NFT. And this is the first important thing to uh, understand when we look at marketplaces, because marketplaces usually can transfer the, your NFTs through smart contracts mm -hmm. even though they are in your wallet. There's one extension of that, and that is you can give an operator approval to all your NFTs. That is usually a marketplace like OpenSea, for example, where you will say, okay, the operator with this address can be a smart contract but can be also any other address, is allowed to spend all the NFTs from my wallet. <clears throat> So this is the basic, really the basic structure of an NFT. And now you might wonder, okay, so if it's just an ID, where does all the like metadata, the image, et cetera, come from? Um, all the traits, the rarity, et cetera, that's all off-chain. Nothing on that is on-chain. In the contract, there's just a function which will give you a URL where one can fetch the metadata for an ID. But on-chain, it's really just the ID. It's not 100% right because there are some projects like CryptoPunks or Moonbirds or more and more projects are transferring their metadata on-chain, so then it's also secured by Ethereum. But in general, by the ERC721 standard, it doesn't say anything that your metadata has to be on-chain. It's easier for pixel projects to put everything on-chain because the data is much more compressed than if I would like, try to upload a 10 megabyte video into the Ethereum blockchain. So, now what does actually a transfer of an NFT look like? Here I really simplified the transfer function of the ERC721 base contract, so I removed a lot of the code to make it very simple. When you transfer an NFT from an address to another address, you, you select the NFT by choosing its token ID, again, for example, Ape100 or whatever. Then what the code will do is it will um, subtract um, the balance from you. It will add one to the balance of the new NFT owner. So then we have the updated balances in the contract. And it will set the owner of the token to the new owner. Finally, and that's very important because without this line, no NFT marketplace would work at all. Um, the contract emits an event. In this case, the so-called transfer event which is um, an event that later on can be um, 
read very easily from the blockchain so that one can listen to all these events and then see, okay, um, if this NFT has transferred from live to Sebastian first and then from Sebastian to somebody else next, then now that is the owner and that's the like, transfer history and then you can build up, um, for example, a dashboard where you see, okay, how many holders does a project have, how many transfers per day, etc. If we don't have events, then you could also build that, but it would be a ton of effort. So the final thing I wanted to show in code here is um, the approval um, thing. So if, and we've just seen that with the data structure, if another contract or address wants to transfer your NFTs, and that can be, for example, a marketplace, then somehow you have to give permission to this marketplace or to this address or to whatever contract you are interacting with so that this address is allowed to spend your NFTs. And at the end, like almost every transfer or whatever in the implementation, we'll call this internal method where it will, where it will check, okay, is the current spender who's trying to apparently transfer the NFT, is it the owner? Or if it's not the owner, then at least did the owner give permission to handling all NFTs of that wallet? Or if not, did the owner at least give addition to spend this particular NFT of the wallet. And this is kind of um, how the internal security checks of NFTs work. And for example, this is also why a lot of people um, get hacked or lose their NFTs because um, they hang out in Discord and then somebody posts, okay, wow, this is a super limited a mint opportunity, like we're releasing um, limited NFTs. People go to their website, they connect with their MetaMask, and then um, what these projects do is they will pop up, uh, um, they will like ask the user to sign only a message or sign a transaction where you then give them approval to, so that they can spend your NFTs. And then, yeah, they can do whatever they want. And that is how a lot of people lost, lost their NFTs already. And this is why I think it's important to understand approvals. I think in the future we will see wallets making it much easier for users so that um, there will be a big warning or so and MetaMask for example already did a good job They will show you right now that if you're giving approval they will show okay You are giving this contract approval to spend all your NFTs of this collection and then it doesn't happen that easily But in the beginning it was really a mess and when when for example, we've been minting a lot of NFTs um, We always had to check the smart contracts first before we minted um, and of course like because not everyone is a Solidity developer, that's pretty hard for everyone to do. So, um, now that we've seen how NFTs work, let's also check out how a marketplace then works. So an NFT marketplace, first of all, consists of uh, smart contracts. Um, so the NFT contracts are in the blockchain, but also the marketplace usually has a, a set of defined smart contracts. And then we have a back-end system, which um, is often called indexer because it indexes all the events we've just seen, also the transfer event from the blockchain. And um, usually also the order book at the moment is managed in a centralized way. There are projects which are working on decentralized order books, but right now most of them are centralized. And the back-end listens to whatever, what happens on-chain. We then have the front end. It can be a website, but it can also be a mobile app. And a wallet which is connected with the front end. Uh, it may be MetaMask. I just used it because it's the most like, prominent wallet out there, but it can be also the Cobalt wallet. It could be uh, Wallet Connect with a Trust wallet. It can be anything. Yeah, and um, there's a connection between the front end uh, and the wallet where the front end is asking the user um, through the wallet to sign messages or to submit transactions. And um, these are then submitted to the blockchain. And in addition, um, the front end fetches, for example, NFT metadata from the back end. So the back end is usually querying the smart contracts to get the metadata URLs from the project it will download them, it will usually cache them, 
put them into a database so that the front end doesn't need to scan the whole blockchain for, for all the data in it, but instead it's aggregated and can be queried in a very simple way. And also the front end is sending signed messages like listings and offers in particular to the back end, which we will see uh, in a second as well. And this is really the high level overview and the components you need to build a marketplace. So how do listings actually work? First of all, when you want to list an NFT on a marketplace, what you do is you give the marketplace approval to your NFTs. You would only need to give approval to one NFT, but then you would need to run the approval transactions all the time uh, for every NFT you list, which would be, it would cost gas and it would be also a lot of effort. So, these marketplaces usually just ask you to give them approval to spend all your NFTs of one collection. Of course, they can only spend them in the way their smart contracts are designed. They cannot just transfer them away. But if they have a bug in their smart contract, this smart contract has approval, then your NFTs will be lost. So this is the first thing you do. And this is a transaction which, unfortunately, it will cost gas on... Um, Ethereum a couple of dollars and other on other chains it can be cheaper. So next, you as the owner, you create a listing. Uh, what is the listing? You choose the NFT of your portfolio and then you choose the price you want to list it for. And then you actually sign that as a message. That's why, for example, when you list something on OpenSea, you will first do the approval transaction and then in the next step, OpenSea will ask you to sign a message. So, for example, MetaMask will pop up again. And there will be some information which you need to sign for the listing. But you don't submit a transaction. You just sign the message. And that's sent to the back end. So it's not submitted to the blockchain directly. And then if somebody comes and wants to buy your NFT for the price and the, and, and the NFT ID you specified, then the signed message, the listing message, is kind of taken and um, put into the blockchain and fulfilled because of the new person be willing to pay the new price. And then in the smart contract, there's some logic where it says, okay, if we have a signed mes message allowing this listing for this NFT ID with this price, and now we have a buyer who's willing to pay the price, then the transaction can be executed. And that's why you, as the seller, don't need to be involved in that process anymore. It can happen like without your control and with, that, with you being offline. And then the NFT is transferred to a new owner. And this is also, for example, uh, and that's one thing that happened to a lot of people, these listings, um, they have to be actively invalidated on chain. So if you just list a lot of NFTs and then you just, um, like, and then um, you actually uh, don't plan to, to uh, sell the NFTs anymore and um, you don't properly, properly delist them, but for example, you transfer them to a different wallet. You might have one hot wallet and one cold wallet and you think, okay, I don't want to list them anymore. I will transfer them to my cold wallet. And then at some point in the future, you decide, okay, I will transfer them back from my cold wallet. I want to trade them now. And you didn't invalidate the old listings then somebody will um, grab your signed messages from the past and if the price of the NFT has risen, it will still submit the listings into the contract, execute them and buy your NFTs for the old price. And this happened to a lot of people and then everyone is calling it, oh, it's an open sea bug or a security issue. It is an issue, but usually um, it's more an issue on the, the user layer. It is very complicated and um, but still, um, yeah, you have to always be careful and always check uh, if you properly delisted NFTs if you don't want to sell them anymore. So how does that apply to bidding? It's a little bit the same way. So um, the NFT bidder grants approval for um, spending uh, on Ethereum, for example, wrapped Ether, um, which is like a representation of Ether that allows interaction with, with Ether as an ERC-20 token. And the marketplace is allowed to spend the Ether for the user. 
kind of, if you want to sell an NFT, the marketplace is allowed to transfer your NFT. Now the marketplace is allowed to transfer your wrapped Ether. And then um, you kind of do the same. You, you um, make an offer where you sign a message with how much do you want to bid on an NFT, on which NFT, and that's also sent to the, the order book or the indexer. And then somebody uh, might fulfill your offer. Okay, this is a bug. Here it should say offer instead of listing. Um, and in that case, when somebody is willing to give you the NFT for the agreed price, the wrapped ether will be transferred to you and the offerer will receive um, the NFT. And, so, and here you see that the back end, the indexer, in this case, it's like also the order book. It can be different servers, whatever. Um, it's a very relevant element. So NFT marketplaces are not working with everything on chain. Um, here you still need um, the backend component. So now, uh, because all this is very complicated, and especially, um, I would say, two years ago, it was very hard to launch an NFT marketplace uh, which would provide kind of the functionality OpenSea does. Um, and we asked ourselves, okay, we, uh, as we are contributing to the EVM project of Horizon, uh, we see NFTs as one super relevant part of uh, bringing traction to the network. We thought, okay, how can we bring a marketplace uh, to the chain without having to spin up a team of 20 developers or so? And that's where Reservoir Protocol comes in. This is a very, very new open source project. Um, it uh, launched at end of 2000, uh, 2021. Actually, at that time, it was really basic and not ready for usage. It, it took a couple of months uh, until it was really usable. It's MIT licensed, so everyone can use it and everyone can also contribute. The front end and back end are both built in a very um, good way from my developer perspective, where you can fork the repositories and um, start to extend the projects without having to adjust too much of the core code base. The team is also very responsive on Discord, so we've been in touch with the developers already, and um, they're always uh, happy to ask questions and to help uh, developers who want to build with the protocol. And it's built with, from my perspective, um, intuitive programming languages, uh, TypeScript and Node.js in the back end, and then uh, React.js and Next.js in the front end, and some stuff in Solidity for smart contracts. Uh, but mainly, if you want to adjust stuff, you can always work in TypeScript, which is uh, very nice. OK, so. Um, the missing point uh, here is that Reservoir, does, they do have their own marketplace contracts, but they also did see that OpenSea launched Seaport. So what OpenSea did here is they um, put a lot of their Solidity code base open source and made it more to um, a protocol where everyone can use the contracts and deploy an NFT marketplace, like an on the contracts which are needed for an NFT marketplace uh, to any network. They also pre-deployed it to various networks already on Ethereum. The, the, it is on Ethereum, it is, I don't know, on BNB chain, Polygon. On a lot of chains it's already deployed because they made also the deployment scripts in a way where if you use the exact bytecode of um, their implementation, then it's always deployed to the same address. Yeah, and then um, I think it was only one week or so after Seaport announced that um, they are releasing this uh, reservoir. Uh, one week after they said, okay, we will um, support um, the smart contracts of Seaport as well. Yeah, so what's Seaport? Again, just very quickly, it's uh, launched in early um, 2022, I think in March or so. It's also MIT licensed. Um, it has a high quality audit and it's used by the industry leader by OpenSea. And as I already mentioned, it's pre-deployed to, to a couple of networks already. So um, now um, I would like to show a quick demo to um, yeah, let you all see how the marketplace looks like. And this is really 
almost a default deployment of the marketplace. Uh, I just deployed it again a couple of days ago on Gnosis Chain. Gnosis Chain is just a EVM compatible um, network which has low fees and is nice to use for development purposes. And um, I use the standard front end of, um, of Reservoir Protocol. When we are going to launch it on um, the Horizon EVM network, of course, we will have fully custom branding and everything will be a bit different. Like, um, <coughs> it will not be just a standard marketplace, but I will show that on a later slide. But as how we can see here already, is that in general, it's all already a very solid front end. If you think about that, this is all open source, free to use, and uh, maintained on a day-by-day -day basis. You can create pull requests, you can work with the team. Um, you see that you have all the features you need, an activity of the trades happening, a list of NFTs where you can filter like on any other marketplace. Um, and these are some test NFTs I just deployed um, to the Gnosis chain, just used the uh, Moonbirds artwork. <coughs> it even has some features to make collection offers, to sweep the floor, etc. So it's really a nice feature set that comes out of the box where it just works and you just need to apply your styling to get all this functionality. And this was not at all possible one year ago. There was nothing out there which would, uh, could compete with that. Um, there have been projects, but every time then we started to deploy something on another open source project, it was always that, I don't know, after two days or so, too much stuff didn't work and we had to cancel the project. What we can also hear and what's also a complicated part to build is that um, they implemented the perfect purchasing flow. So if you open up an NFT, you will see all the different information. Um, it will even allow you to aggregate liquidity from other NFT marketplaces like we see here with OpenSea and LuxRare. So the protocol uh, can get liquidity from other marketplaces as well. <coughs> and then the um, checkout flow this is my opinion. Um, if, and you're fully flexible to design that how you want. Uh, build in a super cool way and it just works. And um, yeah, I think the team of Reservoir did an a crazy good job implementing this. And we, f in the context of Horizon, I think we are very lucky that um, they came out with this now this year and we are at the stage where we can perfectly use it and bring it to the Horizon EVM chain. Yeah, so when launch, uh, what's next? Um, we will deploy an, or also a customized version which already has some Horizon specific styling, etc to the Horizon EVM sidechain testnet as soon as all RPC endpoints we need are supported. Like the last testnet deployment, it was already allowing smart contracts, et cetera, and transactions um, that was already running well. But for marketplace, because of the backend service and so on, you need some RPC methods which, which are not required for regular wallet transactions, but the indexer needs them to fetch information properly from, from the blockchain. <clears throat> we also will uh, launch um, a first collection on the uh, Horizon EVM uh, sidechain when it really launches because uh, we think, yeah, okay, if we would deploy a marketplace, then okay, then there is a marketplace. But of course, you need content. And what we've seen in the past is that uh, traction of a marketplace really kicks off only when there's like one pacemaking collection, which has some uh, great community building artwork. Um, a, a properly structured whitelisting process to build up like some hype for the collection. And this is the like teasered artwork we have already almost finished. So um, we will work on this over the next um, weeks and months and are really looking uh, forward to launch it. Yeah, thank, thanks for listening so far. You can use this QR code to um, check out the marketplace. There's like one issue, which is, uh, I think, funny to explain. Um, uh, as you've seen, I've used the Moonbirds artwork for the marketplace. So what I did is I deployed an NFT on the Gnosis chain, and I just used <coughs> the URL, which Moonbirds also use for the artwork. And actually, that URL is down now. So I don't know, the Moonbirds artwork, 
you can't fetch it at the moment. So the NFTs won't have images now, but I think Moonbird's team will probably fix it later and then it will be back up, but still. You can test it and um, my goal would be that when we work on this, that um, we try to send some internal testing links or so when this deploys on the testnet so that everyone can try it out on the Horizon EVM sidechain as well. Yeah, otherwise um, I'm happy to answer your questions if there are some. <laughs>